So hello everyone and welcome. Uh, it's Friday today, another IMPW webinar, this time on the management of unintended and accidental exposures. And today's speaker is Dr. Colin Martin, a very well-known colleague. I'd like to start by introducing our moderator, Professor Eva Bezak. Eva works at the University of South Australia. She is the Secretary General of the IOMP and the Vice President and President-elect of the AFON, the Asia Oceania Federation of Organizations for Medical Physics. From 2006 till 2015, she was a Chief Physicist at the Royal Adelaide Hospital responsible for uh, services provision to radiation oncology in South Australia. In 2010, she was elected president of the Australasian College of Physical Scientists and Engineers in Medicine. Eva, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, John. And it is a real pleasure to moderate this last in the series of lectures to celebrate International Medical Physics Week. If you allow me, I will share my screen. And I trust that you can see my screen now, correct? Yes, yes. yes. We Thank can. you. And I have even a bigger pleasure to introduce Dr. Colin Martin to present the last talk that is of interest to all medical physics specialists whether in imaging nuclear medicine or radiation oncology, to talk about management of unintended and accidental exposures. Dr. Colin Martin worked as a hospital-based medical physicist in radiation protection in Glasgow and Aberdeen, Scotland for over 30 years. He is an honorary senior lecturer from the University of Glasgow and is vice chair of ICRP committee three on protection in medicine. He chairs two ICRP task groups and is a member of several others. Uh, he also chaired two IAEA technical meetings on avoidance and prevention of radiation incidents in medicine. His research interests include radiation protection, diagnostic radiology, radiation dosimetry, non-ionizing physics, and many others. He is an author of over 300 articles, including 150 papers in peer-reviewed scientific journals. You can, I hope you all agree with me that Colin is one of the best experts to talk to us today on the management of radiation incidents. Colin, it's my pleasure to have you here today with us, and I'm handing over to you and looking forward to your excellent lecture. Thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, we, uh, oh, in the last few years, we've been looking more into how to prevent radiation incidents following a recommendation of, in the Bond call for action uh, that we should be trying to prevent radiation incidents. And so uh, I'm going to talk today, um, give a sort of fairly broad talk, talk about the categories of incident, the potential effects from substantial exposures, a bit about unintended fetal exposures, contamination incidents in nuclear medicine, investigation into causes of incidents and the sort of things that we, we need to put in place um, to try and prevent them, as well as the assessment of doses. Now, um, the basic safety standards say that, says that any unintended event, uh, including operating errors, equipment failures, and other mishaps, the consequences of which uh, are not negligible from the point of view of protection of safety. So it defines an accident as that, and an incident also includes initiating events, uh, accident precursors, and near misses. Um, in nuclear medicine, or these predominantly involve um, exposures of patients, but in fact, in nuclear medicine, you can also not infrequently get exposures of staff through contamination incidents. 
So the category of instance in the um, basic safety standards is an error in procedure. That's where something goes wrong leading up to the procedure so that the wrong individual or the wrong tissue or organ um, is exposed. And there's a, what's called a diagnostic exposure greater than intended. And this is where some sort of error or mistake occurs in the actual procedure, the, the, um, um, the, performance, <clears throat> the performance of the imaging itself. Um, an equipment failure um, or sometimes a software problem uh, can also lead to, an <clears throat> lead to unintended exposures. And sometimes there may be an inadvertent exposure of an embryo or the fetus, which we want to prevent, and also interventional exposures greater than um, or which give rise to substantial radiation doses where um, you can get tissue reactions. <clears throat> so this shows the distribution of um, exposures we found in radiology in a study we did in our hospitals in the west of Scotland. And so most or uh, the largest proportion were some sort of error in the procedure. Uh, the next group were mistakes in the actual performance of the exam, and then just over 20% uh, relating to equipment faults. In nuclear medicine, it was uh, slightly different with even the higher proportion being from procedural errors. And generally it's less than about 10% of fetal exposures. Now, examples of incidents due to procedural errors might be that the wrong patient might be identified, uh, the wrong examination performed. So this is a mistake made in the department, but sometimes we get a request for the wrong patient or repeat exposures from duplicate requests where the error is made by the referrer. So there can be different sources of the error. But in diagnostic radiology, um, we might get the wrong side of the body or the wrong limb examined. That would generally be a procedural error. Whereas incorrect exposure factors, uh, in, inappropriate setting of the AEC, poor patient positioning, poor collimation, or um, performing a CT without contrast, they're all mistakes that occur in the procedure, it's in the uh, imaging procedure itself. So in nuclear medicine, um, again, you can get administration of the wrong right, radiopharmaceutical or also as well as the, the a pregnant patient, a breastfeeding woman um, might be uh, inadvertently um, given a test we, uh, and they could then pass radionuclides onto their breastfeeding infant. Uh, failure to carry out a procedure after administration can also occur in nuclear medicine or the instructions given to the patient might not be followed and that might result in the wrong distribution. Mistakes that can occur actually in the performance um, might be failure of the preparation chemistry. So the radionuclide accumulates in the wrong organ, it might be an error in the gamma camera setup, uh, some sort of inaccurate calibration or a problem with the radionuclide calibrator. Or there might be extravation of the radiopharmaceutical in tissue rather than in the vein, giving rise to a localized exposure. So what are the potential effects of radiation exposures? Well, with that most diagnostic procedures, they will really just give uh, an increased risk of stochastic effects, primarily cancer. Um, special considerations are required for pediatric patients and females who are pregnant or, or lactating in nuclear medicine. Um, but th these are sort of longer term risks, whereas in the interventional and therapeutic procedures, um, where you've got sort of complex use of radiation, you can get substantial radiation doses, which might give a risk of skin reactions. You can also get this in therapeutic uh, injections uh, if the um, radiopharmaceutical is extravated in the tissue rather than in the, uh, in the vein. The therapeutic nuclear medicine procedures, if the wrong radiopharmaceutical was given, might also irradiate other tissues such as the bone marrow, kidney or thyroid. So <clears throat> the risks in interventional radiology, the complexity of the interventional co uh, procedures covered with, coupled with the size of the patient um, really 
combine to um, make some procedures more risky. So the skin doses are two to five gray. There's a risk of erythema and epilation or hair loss, but you'd not normally expect to have any. Whereas at doses of five to 10 gray, uh, there may be prolonged erythema and epilation. And to the higher end of that scale, they're like, these may be permanent uh, changes. When you get to 10 to 15 gray, you can get uh, possible dry or moist desquamation and the skin likely to be weakened. And then above that, um, there might be skin breakdown, lethal, deeper lesions, and these might require surgery. And in some cases, because these procedures are complex and life-saving, it may not be possible to avoid skin reactions altogether. So how do we reduce risks of tissue reactions? Well, we need to optimize. Um, so first of all, optimize the equipment program options that are available. And this will be done normally at the at commissioning when the equipment is installed um, by the medical physics expert. Then prepare protocols that take account of patient size um, and, and give interventional clinicians and staff specialist training in radiation dose management techniques. And the amount of training, it should really relate to the level of risk. So you, with an interventional cardiologist performing complex procedures, the, the training will be different to ones to um, a clinician doing sort of minor procedures on a mobile image intensifier. Then carry out periodic updates and refresh your training and make sure that staff are aware of the potential doses and the dose metrics so they understand what's displayed on the equipment. Now, if we go back to the 1990s, when these sort of effects were first recognized, for a couple of examples of the effect of core training, we see in this case, um, this patient is a lar large patient. They've had multiple car coronary angiography procedures. Um, it looks as though the X-ray uh, projection that's been used has been the same one throughout a large proportion of the examination and perhaps also the x-ray tube was too close to the sin surface but whatever it gave rise to significant tissue damage which required um, surgical intervention. In the second case um, the um, interventionalist has moved the x-ray tube around but rather than using small angulations. They've gone through the thickest parts of the body, um, so requiring a higher intensity to produce the images. And because of this, produce areas of uh, significant erythema. They've also included the arms in the projection. So we want to prepare before each examination, review the patient information and requirements to assess the potential risk of exceeding three gray. If procedures are repeated with a dose level over about one gray on the same patient, then this can increase the risk of injury because of cell depletion in that area. And if a patient shows signs of skin damage, then there may be a need to avoid further exposure of that area. So this could be uh, marked, um, say with wire or paper clips, so the operators are aware of the location of the injury. And then track the dose level during the procedure so you can see how the dose is progressing and use alert and trigger levels to um, think about changing practice. So what quantities have we got? Well, the dose displayed on interventional units is the air coma at the interventional reference point, also called the cumulative air coma. So the interventional reference point is 15 centimeters in front of the isocenter. So it approximates to the position of the skin. So it gives an indication of the air coma in the center of the beam at the position of the skin throughout an examination. So the cumulative dose um, doesn't take account of the movement of the x-ray tube. So it's likely to be a bit higher than the peak skin dose, although it doesn't include back, the contributions from backscatter. Now, the threshold and severity of <clears throat> the tissue reaction is actually linked to the peak skin dose. And there are um, now being developed <clears throat> software skin, <clears throat> sorry, 
software for mapping skin dose distributions, um, manufacturers can supply any color code. But a forthcoming revision of the IEC standard on this is expected to contain requirements for real time skin dose maps. So this hopefully in the future should reduce the risk of unex <clears throat> unexpected skin reactions. And the colors at the bottom give an indication of what might be used as colors. So we want to monitor this dose level. So we want to set something. And if we get to that level, then we have an alert. So if we look, using the cumulative air Kerma, um, then we can monitor that throughout the procedure, especially on patients considered to be at higher risk. And this responsibility for this might be delegated to a radiographer, medical physicist or, or nurse. And then when an alert level is set at which the interventionist should be informed about the dose, then they may consider modifying the procedure or they might consult a colleague, but whatever, the actions could be recommended in a, in a protocol. So, but what the clinical outcome must be the priority, even if a, an alert level is reached. Then also set a higher, what we call a trigger level. So this should be above, uh, um, though any patient receives above that, uh, should be informed and then followed up after the procedure. So suggested dose and trigger levels are well, cumulative air coma, uh, three gray for the alert level and five gray for the trigger level. But uh, values in terms of coma area product are also suggested and in peak skin dose. So these are from guidelines um, published um, over 10 years ago, but promoted else, uh, elsewhere. Now, this focus on optimization is important. So um, on the right, this shows a, a study by Steve Bolter and colleagues showing the numbers of patients with it going through his facility in the Columbia University Medical Center, which are above uh, five to seven gray in blue, um, between seven and 10 gray in brown, and above 10 gray in gray. So with a focus on optimization, um, being aware of all the different factors, they've managed to gradually reduce the numbers of patients or the proportion of patients with um, which have skin doses with the potential to give effects. So, uh, nearly so sort of virtually el eliminating the effects by gradually bringing the cumulative air coma down. And we certainly in, in, uh, in Glasgow find that um, it applies to about maybe one to two percent of patients. So I think centres with uh, optimised um, procedures, improvements in equipment should be able to achieve those sort of levels. But you need to focus on uh, the on the optimization. So if a dose alert is exceeded, dose information should be recorded in the medical record and the patient monitored in their future intervention. But that's if the alert level is exceeded. But if the trigger level is exceeded for follow-up, then the patient themselves should be informed of the risk and their general practitioner or the referring doctor uh, made aware. Then on discharge, the patient is recommended to ask a caregiver to inspect the area of skin irradiated for signs of redness after three to four weeks. So we can split those sort of groups. So if the cumulative air coma is between five and seven gray, then the patient uh, should be asked to contact the clinic if they observe redness. And with the availability of mobile phones that, um, and uh, cameras, they can easily take a photo and send that and then following that, so that can be followed up at the clinic. Whereas if the cumulative air coma is over seven gray, then maybe there should be arrangements for making contact with the patient and following them up. So be taking a, a more proactive uh, role in the, uh, in the intervention. Now, there's a wide range in the cumulative air coma values at which effects occur. So patients, um, have recorded quite high cumulative air coma values for examinations of the trunk with no effects. But we, we found in uh, newer radiology, uh, there are effects um, quite 
commonly of uh, hair thinning and sort of uh, redness of uh, skin experienced uh, above five gray and a few of those um, below five gray. So for our patients in neuroradiology in, in Glasgow, we have a trigger level of three gray uh, for follow-up. <clears throat> the skin reactions can also occur from CT. Um, the dynamic perfusion, uh, this involves a series of acquisitions um, at the same position on the head. And probably most of you have seen these um, pictures uh, from a famous case where there were problems because of a mistake made in the setting for the CT scanner. These skin reactions shouldn't occur and are rare, but as a way of trying to prevent them, the CTDI vol, which is displayed on the CT scanner, is um, that, that dose is really quite similar throughout the head. So in fact, the value of the CTDI vol is similar to the skin dose. So a radiation dose check feature can provide an alert to the CT scanner operator when a, a recommended level of the CTI vol is reached. So values can be set of 600 milligray or one gray. So, and the system programmed to alert the operator um, if that value is going to be exceeded. The skin reactions can also occur in nuclear medicine. Um, in, um, if you've got a significant localization of radionuclide in the tissue, uh, from diagnostic procedures, these are very rare um, and uh, only occasionally produce symptoms. But for um, injections with therapeutic beta emitters, they, they can be severe. I mean, particularly radionuclides like yttrium-90, phosphorus-32, iodine-131 or strontium-89, and you can get localized doses of 10 to 50 gray reported, leading to a sort of swelling, tenderness, neurothema, um, may be leading on to moist desquamation after four to five weeks. And you can also get radionecrosis along the needle tracks. So there have been quite a few reports of this in the literature. And um, an example is uh, shown of one with the I131 MIBG, where the dose was 20 to 40 gray. And sometimes these have required uh, surgical intervention. So now moving on to unintended fetal exposures. It's really a sort of failure to identify a female who is pregnant or an, uh, more usually an unknown early pregnancy. So the risk from fetal exposure is one uh, of um, childhood cancer. So, but the cancer risk from one millisieve is about three times that for the population as, as a whole. So it's about one in 650 up to the uh, age of 15 years. Um, the risk of malformation is really non-existent. These don't occur at doses less than 100 milligray, and we don't experience those in the diagnostic uh, imaging. To give you a so rough indication of some of the doses, you can see here that most of them are very low. There's just <clears throat> a few if you get high dose examinations of the pelvic and abdominal region, then that's the, the main time when we need to be concerned. And you'll all be familiar with the, the various systems we have in place. Um, notices in waiting areas asking female patients to inform staff if they could be pregnant. Agreed procedures for screening female patients. Confirming dates of last menstrual period. Particular care is required for ID-131 because the fetal thyroid uh, uptake takes this up at the gestational age from eight to 10 weeks. And if exposure occurred in that sort of period, then the doses to the fetal thyroid could be hundreds of milligray. So if a decision is made to justify the examination based on the clinical need, then special attention needs to be given to dose optimization. And if a female patient is unintentionally exposed, then there should be an internal investigation to find out why it occurred and the fetal dose assessed. So I mentioned contamination in nuclear medicine. Um, but this is not, not uncommon. There's all sorts of causes, spills from vials dropped and broken, um, poor syringe needle or butterfly connections. If 
if the connection's not made properly with a syringe and the plunger is pressed, then the, there's a risk of the um, radionuclide spraying out or leaking out. And, and failure of good practice, fail to use disposable gloves for injection can make this worse. There's also potential risk of contamination with patient body fluids, vomit, incontinent patients, leaking catheter, and you can get leakage from um, the drain the drainage pipes for the when the sink used for disposal. So simple um, <clears throat> procedures which are should be in place in all radionuclide laboratories, protective clothing, seal benches and floors, carrying out manipulations over trays with absorbent uh, material laid on the tray to absorb any spill, secure connections for syringes and needles, and regular monitoring for contamination. All of these should help to reduce the risk from any contamination event. And to, if we look at the risk from patients, vomit from radio iodine patients giving oral administration of iodine 131, um, that if they fail to swallow or regurgitate it, that could result in significant contamination. So the patients can be asked to remain in the department perhaps for 15 or 20 minutes following an administration of iodine therapy in an area where there's a wash basin and toilet to hand to help decontamination. And in continent patients, the sanitary pads may be adequate for patients undergoing diagnostic nuclear medicine tests, but they're certainly less desirable for therapy patients. So a risk assessment should be carried out before therapy is undertaken. Catheterization may be considered, but it does have associated problems. So if an incident occurred, what do we do to follow it up? Well, we want to assess the consequences for the patient affected and provide any additional healthcare necessary as a, a first, um, uh, first aim. But we need to identify what went wrong and try and implement changes to address any deficiencies and minimize the likelihood of it occurring in the future. So, and to make also that information about the incident available then to the general manager so he, he or she can disseminate it through the relevant radiation safety committees. There's also a wider purpose to inform others if this type of radiation accident could occur more widely, particularly with radiation incidents, um, which it's, uh, we recommend that you report them through the IAEA SAFRA database in order to raise awareness. So an incident occurs, what do you do then? Well, you need to record information, obviously the region of the body is radiated, but things like error codes or unusual signals, the information is available at the time the incident occurs, but then may not be later. And also exposure data. Um, again, that may be available later through dose structured reports, um, but um, rec recording as much data as possible at the time is helpful. Uh, in, all, in carrying out the investigation, it's perhaps quite useful to report an individual to manage the in-depth investigation and make them responsible for preparing a report. So the investigator should obtain detailed information and conduct face-to-face -face interviews with staff, but it must adopt a no-blame culture. We, what we want to do is find out what happened, make sure we don't want it doesn't occur in the future. So we need to put people at ease not to blame people because we want to find out the facts. And we aim to identify the root causes and contributory factors. And there may be all sorts of different in contributory factors. Uh, I've given a few here, I'll just pick out a few, inadequate training, perhaps poor knowledge of the equipment, uh, poor operating procedures, maybe inexperienced staff are not supervised properly, um, maybe ambiguities in the functions and lines of authority, so people don't know who's responsible for what. And often you get a number of these um, things occurring in or before an incident actually occurs, but all of them potentially contribute and need to be identified. So what should the incident report contain? Which would say uh, what occurred, why did it happen, uh, what was the radiation dose, did any deficiencies in 
procedures or staff training contributes to the incident. And then importantly, it should follow up and look at remedial actions to see what improvements could and should be made to minimize the risk of similar incidents in the future. And the responsibility for addressing the deficiencies will lie with the general manager, but it must be identified who has responsibility to make sure that they carry that out. And then on completion of the investigation, the staff should be debriefed so that the causes of the incident can be explained to them and any adjustments made in the procedures described. So there's various sort of systems to reduce procedural errors be regularly analyze and review the procedures, go through them, I try to identify what might go wrong. Uh, then having a pause and check of critical items on a list before commencing, particularly for maybe at the start of interventional procedures. Um, check the correct patient, possibility of pregnancy, justification, has the exam been justified, all these different aspects. So to have a tick list to work, uh, um, identify each. Then have agreed procedures of, I've just been describing for investigation and reporting of incidents with responsibilities for taking action to address the deficiencies well defined. And then again, as I've just said, hold meetings to review incidents, determine causes and share experiences. Now, what I've been talking about so far has really involved the types of incidents which occur within the imaging department. But as we already said, um, there are a certain proportion. I mean, in our radiology department, it was 23% were due to errors of refer from the referrer and 22% from an equipment fault. So we have to have a different approach from them. So for Referral errors, the system might involve the lead clinician sending a formal letter or email to the referrer and then copies to the consultant or practice manager. And this letter might explain what happened and or should explain what happened and then request a written explanation of why they occurred and also what action is going to be taken to try to minimize those risks in the future. So that's how we try to approach this problem in our hospitals in Scotland, in, in the west of Scotland. So for equipment faults, these can lead to more radiation being delivered or maybe the patient might be exposed but no images produced. So then you need a slightly different approach. Uh, obviously the unit should be taken out of service straight away to avoid exposing other patients. But then the investigation will have to involve the manufacturer's representative medical physics expert and the imaging staff involved. So where they all have input into what happens and you need to obtain technical reports from the equipment suppliers as well. So, and then work out exactly what happened and before returning to clinical use, verify that the equipment performance is satisfactory. So, um, Minimizing, if we look at a wider scale, when one of these equipment faults uh, has potential wider consequences, then a report should be submitted to the National Incident Reporting Centre. But at the local level, we can have systems in place to try and reduce the risk. Um, if we have comp comprehensive acceptance testing when the equipment's installed, we have adequate maintenance of the imaging equipment, we have effective QA programs, checking that nothing is changing. We have a, an equipment replacement program in place so that when it near the end of its life, there's funding available for a new uh, system. It's useful to record equipment related uh, issues in the fault book, a fault log book, so that others, other users can see. And also this gives an indication of whether the equipment might need to be replaced. And then checking the, the dose performance after, after maintenance, after software upgrades to make sure there's no uh, changes being made that affect dose in ways people are not aware of. In nuclear medicine, staff need to be aware of, of a whole variety of things that might go wrong. I, I've uh, only mentioned a few here, but in the preparation of the radiopharmaceuticals, there might be problems in storage in the bio, there might be biological contamination, problems in the labeling of kits and dispensing in the QC. 
In the patient preparation, there might be incomplete instructions given to the patient, problems in patient ID of administration, and then in the imaging errors in the scanner setup and problems with calibration. So we need to identify the issues before they give rise to any problems. So be aware of all these. So if things start to um, look uh, or appear in checks um, to be slightly wrong, then act at an early stage and have comprehensive systems in place to track and check radiopharmaceutical. We also need to assess the doses of radiation incidence and have a methods of conveying the risk. So radiation doses from exposures relating to stochastic effects, um, which will be most of those from diagnostic um, exams, or perhaps will, should be all from diagnostic exams, we can use as a measure the effective dose to a reference person. So it's very useful for small exposures and calculations are simple. The effective dose can be derived from exposure data such as the Delsang's product in, in CT, Kerma area product in intervention, or the activity for nuclear medicine and the ICRP produces coefficients for calculating of doses in nuclear medicine. So what are the sort of dose levels that people generally um, that result from these sort of examinations. Well, this again shows the distribution of dose from the exam, the, the incidents that were reported over quite a long period in the hospitals in my area. And you'll see that 63% um, of the examinations gave, of the, uh, sorry, incidents gave an effective dose less than 0.5 millisieverts. So it's a the majority were giving very low doses. Um, the ones giving higher doses tended to be CT or nuclear medicine. And you see there's um, only 0.9% gave a dose over 20 millisieverts. But in fact, we only were recording one incident for every 10,000 procedures. So that's less than one in a million with a dose more than 20 millisieverts. But if we have systems in place, hopefully we can eliminate and cut down uh, in those. Well, we want to give an impression of the risk. Um, there are methods of calculating risk, but if we're using effective dose, it's better just to give a general descriptor term. We've recommended in our latest ICRP publication on dose quantities that the terminology negligible, minimal, very low and low should be used for these um, for, for describing risks in general terms because when one gives numbers uh, this often gives a, a much um, it gives an impression that we have a much greater knowledge of what the risks are than we actually do in many cases but this gives a, a more realistic assessment of what the risk might be if the excess effective doses more than 10 millisieverts, then we might want to carry out a full evaluation of doses for the individual radiosensitive organs and tissues. Um, but this will be a, a, according to a local agreement. But if you do that, then you can assess the quantitative risks for exposure of each organ using age and sex related coefficients. And we have coefficients in our latest ICRP publication, but there are various others available. So where an in-depth assessment of risk is required, this assessment should will be will need to be carried out by a medical physics expert with the appropriate experience. Assessing skin doses can be more difficult. It can pro, um, the cumulative air coma probably provides the best uh, assessment, um, particularly where fields overlap. But in many cases, the fields won't overlap. And although skin effects could occur at values of five gray, they're seldom observed in interventional procedures on the trunk uh, until higher values, as I've already said. Assessments in nuclear medicine, where there's extubation of um, a therapeutic injection, 
Um, imaging can be used or monitoring depending on the radionuclide to confirm what the distribution of activity and the amount of activity in the tissues might be. Um, if this is done at the time of the event and then the dose um, can be evaluated from the activity coupled with the time that the activity remains in the tissue. Um, I mean, I've given an, uh, an example image here, but this is for a bone scan where you wouldn't expect any tissue effects. So estimating the fetal dose, the detailed estimates of dose will be needed if the fetus is in or near the primary beam. And the estimate made by a qualified medical physics expert. Installation specific measurements and calculations are preferable, especially if the fetal dose is over 10 milligram. So we can use the uh, skin exposure per image for radiography or the CTI vol and the DLP uh, for CT and take the account of the patient's anatomy. And fetal doses for nuclear medicine can, examinations can be evaluated using ICRP coefficients. But John Demelakis' group have made uh, software freely available on the internet, so from the University of Crete. And this can calculate fetal doses for x-ray procedures. Um, and um, there are modules uh, for radiography, fluoroscopy, computer tomography, and for occupational exposure. So I'd recommend if you do have a fetal exposure in radiology, then use these. So how do we reduce the risk of instance and try to encourage a radiation safety culture where we're aware? We need a strong management and organizational structure so all the procedures and protocols should be agreed and documented. And these documents should be under regular review by identified managers. And staff, we need to be committed uh, to and adhering to the uh, agreed systems. So we need to encourage a culture of always working with awareness and alertness. Uh, check the robustness of the safety systems against reported incidents. And communication is important in this. So communication systems to ensure that staff are familiar with documents might be through an organization wide information network. Um, these are certainly very suitable for dissemination of information and can be part of a quality system where they are checked and updated regularly. And then have meetings and other arrangements in place to provide a focal point to facilitate discussion about the ways to improve systems. So in summary, first of all, for minimizing tissue reactions in interventional procedures, ensure that interventional staff operating equipment have received in-depth training in the use of the equipment and the techniques and the dose reduction facilities so that they have uh, they built up experience and, and know exactly how to keep doses to the skin as low as possible. And the amount of training should relate to the level of risk in the procedure. Then review the patient information before each procedure to assess the potential risks, whether the person has been examined before, if the patient is large, if the problem's complex, know that beforehand. Use safety checks before commencing the procedure and at critical points within, and then use dose alert values to provide additional safeguards and trigger levels for follow-up of the patients. Then steps to minimize risks of unintended exposures, ensure there's sufficient staff who are trained to the appropriate level, implement update training and continuous professional development. So staff are aware of their need to gradually develop as a professional provide detailed protocols and procedures for each process so everything is clearly set out and clearly define people's roles and responsibilities so staff know what they're responsible for and take responsibility for it. And investigate incidents when they occur to identify root causes and any latent factors. Set out responsibilities for investigation and reporting in written procedures so that if something occurs, you know immediately what is going to take place and who is going to do, do that. And then 
it's important to address any deficiencies that do occur to ensure changes or additional training are carried out. So, so there needs to be that follow-up mechanism automatically in place. And then finally hold meetings to review incidents, share experiences and learn from any errors. If errors do occur, it's unfortunate, but it should be part of a learning experience if we're going to promote this commitment to a strong radiation safety culture and reduce our risk of accidents. So we've um, been with the various working groups that I've been working on over the last few years. So I, I thank you for your attention, but I'd also like to thank all the various members of these groups and for their contributions to the guidelines that we've prepared. And um, you should be able to uh, find these references, which give much of what I've been talking about today, um, and in some cases, a little more detail. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Colin, for your wonderful talk. And I have received some, a few questions and comments in the, during your presentation. So uh, rather than asking the uh, participants to unmute themselves, I will read the questions to you. The first one, would you please explain or emphasize the difference between incidents and accidents with respect to the threshold values? I think the threshold values probably depend very much on the uh, individual country and individual department. So I, I, um, I mean, accidents are generally when there is some sort of consequence. But um, uh, as I say, I mean, we uh, count as, um, I suppose we group them all under incident and we always report um, when something goes wrong and even cases where there hasn't been an exposure, but it could very well have led to the exposure, then we can and follow up that as well. But there's, it's, it's difficult to set a sort of clear distinction, you can't really set a boundary, and it, it is probably very culturally dependent, so I think it would vary for different hospitals. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, in regards to incident investigation, do you feel there is a need for uh, training for the investigators? Uh, in uh, this person experience is that the investigations are often inadequate to truly learn lessons and to improve. Often it is more of a box checking exercise. Um, I, I, I think there probably is. I mean, I certainly, um, I, I've investigated lots of incidents and never received any training in that, but it, it's, it's a, a way, um, trying to probe what is the issues and trying to put people at their ease so they don't feel threatened. Um, so in, in, in some ways it's a sort of uh, so sociological sort of empathy type of uh, training that needs to be coupled to the scientific training in probing exactly what the different factors are. I mean, think going through the different factors which could go wrong, and being aware of those is part of it, but you need to be able to draw out of the individuals that you're interviewing um, mm -hmm. uh, to find out exactly what has happened. Okay. Yeah, and should the referrers be part of this investigation process? You know, uh, looking for the wrong if, referral. If, if it's a refer, I mean, it's it, it all, uh, comes down to manpower, I suppose. I mean, yeah. we, we, so we leave that to the, de the referring departments. But on the other hand, if they don't give us a suitable response, we will sort of come back to them. And if the dose mm -hmm. is over a certain level, then it will be reported to the Scottish ministers. And then yes. the ministers will write them letters. And uh, so they'll, they'll start to put pressure on them to, uh, to put something in place to improve. Yeah. Uh, Colin, would you recommend a reference publication to be used to convert data such as KAP to equivalent dose? Uh, oh, um, 
Well, yeah, yes, our, our, our I'm done. Yes, our, 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 our latest ICRP publication, 147, okay. um, 147, which was only published earlier this year. Mm -hmm. um, that, that has, well, we've tried to, I'm trying to remember the tables. I think we've tried to list, say for, it, it, it's more for uh, CT, I think. Yes. I think it's more for CT, but um, and and for Kerma area product, um, there's a whole variety of, of different ones, and we're trying in ICRP to develop um, factors uh, that can be more uh, or used more widely. But we're still sort of at the development stage for for those, so we have a task group on that. Yeah. Uh, I have a comment here from a clinician who is an expert on the treatment of overexposed patients to ionizing radiation in radiological accidents. Uh, they call them these local radiation injuries. And he made a comment related to those that when the doses are large and uh, the skin will go to necrosis, for these cases, the treatment is very specialized and not necessarily available in all countries. The treatment can consist of an early dose assessment, dosimetry guided surgery, injection of mesenchymal stem cells, and require uh, long-term follow-up is required. Uh, do you think that if the treatment is not available in certain countries, the patients can be sent for treatment to another country or? Uh, I, I think that, that depends very much on the, on the country and uh, 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 other, other countries willing to provide that treatment, I think. So it, it's sort of not related to the revenge of incidents. It's, it, it, that's, um, and I, th I think, again, a lot of these things will vary in different countries around the world, so. Yeah, and their collaborative engagement with their neighbors and everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. With regard to equipment issue logs, has the recent move towards a central IT system approach improved tracking of incidents? Or has removing it one step from the operator and the unit tends to decrease the level of interaction with the system? So has the computerization been good or bad for incident recording? Uh, and equipment I whole, I think on the whole, it, it, it's good. I, I mean, I, 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 I don't know about, um, is this relating to equipment performance? I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. aware of yeah, equipment well. performance, but I mean, I know we, we have a, a, a national register in the UK. So when uh, there is an incident which could affect others, then we report it and there are safety notices, uh, safety action notices which come out and warn people. So I think that works reasonably well in raising awareness, provided the departments and the individuals respond, uh, responsible um, go through and... Exactly. I think it's, you can record whatever, but if no one reads it or, yeah. you know, follows through the log, then it's not worth much. And it, it depends on the local, on the culture. I mean, hopefully in hospitals, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I know we, we used to get safety action notices and then we used to see if we had any of those particular units in and then get in contact with the hospitals that have them and things like that. So I think that, that and also discuss with the engineers from the uh, x-ray yeah. companies. Yeah, so I think exactly. That, Should be reported back to the companies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, this leads me to another question where uh, perhaps the older machines might be more prone to errors. Should there be some sort of rule that the equipment older than 10 years should not be used? Probably not, but because it, it all depends again what resources the country has available. Yeah. As I say, if you have a fault log, then you can see that, that faults are building up and you can see what your priority is for replacing it. But if, um, if you don't have the money to do it, um, well, you can use that as a um, argument to try and get funding, but. Yeah. Um, 
it, it all depends on the funding. Yes, yeah. Uh, where do we stand with the patient when, let's say, the patient has received the dose of 10 millisievert and we try to explain them the, let's say, risk of cancer? However, in real life, we cannot really link doses less than 100 millisievert to cancer incidence. Are we creating unnecessary anxiety for patients? Uh, I, I think so, which is why I try and use general term. I've, I've always advocated using general terminology rather than doing detailed evaluation of risk. So I might do an evaluation for patients over 10 millisieverts, but I wouldn't necessarily, um, I, I'd be unlikely to say to them that there's a risk of one in whatever. Um, mm -hmm. I would say that the, there was a low risk. Um, yes. And then if they wanted me to go to, on to expand on that, then I'd perhaps give them a bit more information and discuss uh, mm -hmm. a bit more with them. Um, so really, uh, uh, patients are often don't have any feeling for the the measure no. for the risk. So, uh, and if you start if you start comparing them with all, risks of all sorts of other accidents, from plane crashes and uh, car crashes, it's it's all quite uh, quite difficult. I mean, I suppose comparing to the natural background um, in yes. the is, is sort of one way or comparing to a number of air flights and things like that yeah. and put things in some sort of perspective as far as radiation dose is concerned but yeah. as, as to giving an actual risk I, I, I prefer not to um, unless pressed. <laughs> yeah. Colin thank you very much I will finish our question time here and we'll hand over to Madan to close this session. Greatly right. appreciate it. I think let John first do it. Yeah. Yes, John. Thank you, Madam. Thank you very much, Eva, for your excellent uh, moderation. I'd like to personally thank Colin for his outstanding uh, presentation today. Thank you so much, Colin, for, for sharing your time and experiences uh, with us. Uh, dear colleagues, this was the last IMPW webinar all good things must come to an end. Thank you for your active participation. It was a truly memorable uh, week. It's time to close, but before giving the floor to the IOMP president, I'd like to thank Professor Stoeva Magdalena for, for her support. A recorded version of this webinar will be available at IOMP's website uh, very soon. So bye bye for me. We will be in touch. Madan, the stage the stage is yours. Thank you, John. At the outset, let me thank you as the co-organizer of this IMPW 2020 webinar series, and also Magdalena for really great contribution in making this happen. Also, I should thank today's speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Colin or, uh, Martin and the moderator Eva Bizek for moderating the session. Also, I would like to thank all the moderators and speakers of this week and in particular now the participants all these days and of today's session. I should share the screen for the subsequent events. Just give me a second. So many times we have seen questions being asked about the recorded one. So just if you put IMPW in Google, it takes you to the on the very first page or first page on International Medical Physics Week. So you have here the IMPW and uh, the activities, the posters, the recorded. Uh, here you have the recorded uh, web, uh, webinar. Uh, webinar recording of last year 20 and 21 rec uh, recording uh, webinar of the recorded and also I should now mention about uh, the next events uh, event of this year which will be the IM IDMP so on the home page if you click the IDMP you will see the International Day of Medical Physics events 
and uh, I encourage you to participate in these events. I also encourage you to send reports of events which you have organized during IMPW week this week, and also what you are going to organize in the IDMP in, in, on 7th of uh, November. And uh, I wish to thank all those who have already sent reports. We have uh, put up some of the reports and we encourage your contribution to the IUMP programs. With that, I wish to thank all of the participants today now. And uh, as I said earlier, the, in the earlier days, if you have participated for your active participation and cooperation, feel free to be in touch. And today there was just a, minute, a, a question about the um, uh, old equipment. Let me mention about the uh, next month program where you will see the uh, uh, these two programs. So if you go to the home page and and then IUMP webinars webinar, if you. So the next webinar is on May 10th, and that is on publications. Uh, the two editors in chief are going to talk about the uh, publications of in medical physics, the editor in chief of the physics in Medi medicine and biology and editor in chief of the medical physics. So on 10th May, I encourage you to register. And after that on 26th May, Steve Walter is going to talk to us on the equipment if you have tested, whether to accept it or to like the question was there today or retire the equipment. So there are guidelines by European Commission and the IEC is developing some guideline also on accuracy of these measurements. So these two webinars are the upcoming webinars and I encourage you to participate in that. With that, thank you very much to all of you and having a wonderful rest of the day or evening or night and bye-bye. Thanks.